You're now David Bossie, Trump 2015 deputy campaign manager and a Fox News contributor, and Jake McAbee, former chief speechwriter to Attorney General Eric Holder and Loretta Lynch. Thank you both gentlemen for being here. Jake, let me start with you. Uh, d did you think they acquitted themselves well in there? Uh, I, I think that the Democrats did some legitimate oversight that's been missing from this, uh, from this administration for the last two years. I don't think that uh, Acting Attorney General Whitaker acquitted himself very well. Uh, at one point, somebody asked, uh, somebody accused the Democrats of selling his character, which is a little ridiculous, uh, considering that, uh, that the Acting Attorney General was previously the pitch man for a fraudulent company that sold toilets and time machines. So he didn't put his best foot forward, for sure. Uh, he didn't come in with the highest of expectations, but he certainly left having, uh, having crawled under the bar that had been set for him. He didn't answer questions. He was angry. He lashed out at members of the committee, at the chairman. It was a it was a bad showing for him, but it was a really important example of oversight that this administration is going to have to get used to. David? Yeah, well, the politics of personal destruction are in full effect, and Jake just continued it just now. Look, that's what they were doing. They uh, they were uh, it was an assault of questions by the Democrats who hate this president more than they love the country. They had no intention of trying to get answers to legitimate questions. This was a sideshow. It was a circus. And that's what this White House is going to be looking at uh, for the next two years. Jake is definitely right about that. And, the, and the, by the way, the Republicans better strap on their helmets and they better find their footing because this is just the first salvo. You know, I mean, it raises a question. I had Trey Gowdy on the other night. He said if I were advising Matt Whitaker, which he wasn't, but, you know, he said if, if I were asked, I would tell him not to go. You know, there's going to be a new attorney general in a matter of days, um, and it was pretty clear where this was going to head. Uh, this is a person who's leaving this position. So what exactly, what was the goal, do you think, Jake? What were they hoping to achieve by trying to get him to admit that he was against the Mueller probe when he really won't have any role, he will not be able to, you know, be effective in one way or the other with regard to the probe in a few days. Well, the goal isn't getting him to admit anything. The goal is to get some insight is into he? the workings oh, of the. Oh, come on! No, they the definitely wanted to some... him to admit that he was biased against the probe, that he thought it was a witch hunt, and that he had been actively trying to do what he could within his ability to, you know, to. to leak information, to get information out there about anything he knew. He said he hasn't seen the report. So how can you say that, based on their questions that we just showed, that that wasn't part of their mission today? I think that they were asking those questions because they wanted those answers. But I don't think that they're difficult questions uh, if the answers are things like, I am, uh, you know, I'm... I am but they didn't this like I'm overseeing answers. this investigation in a fair and reasonable way. I don't think those are difficult questions. They're only difficult um, if you are a person like Matt Whitaker who doesn't want to answer them. I and didn't I don't say they were difficult, difficult questions. I just said they, were, they had a clear, uh, they were questions that appeared to have a pretty clear agenda. Yes. There are the the questions that seem to have a clear answer answers. that he didn't want to touch. He right. said the he, Democrats he, didn't ahead, want their answers. It didn't want Matt Whitaker's answers because those answers were, I didn't speak to the president about this. I didn't impede Mueller's probe at all. I was never involved in the decision making of the Mueller probe. Those answers, which we've all believed to be true because we see the Mueller probe is winding down. We're going to get a report, which we hope will become public so that we, the American people, can see exactly what Mueller was up to. Yeah. I mean, I mean that, that's really what it comes down to here. You know, you, you have... Uh... We don't know. No one knows when this report is going to come out. But that's really going to be, you know, when the pedal hits the metal here, Jake, when, when everybody gets to take a look at exactly what is in this report. Right. And then these questions won't won't really be necessary, I would imagine. Certainly, I think it's really important that the public get a look at this report. Now, William Barr, who's been nominated to be attorney general, hasn't said whether he would allow it to become public. So that's a real problem. But I definitely agree that it should become public, that people should be able to see the result of this probe. Mm -hmm. But part of what we want to make sure of and part of what Democrats are trying to make sure of is that this probe is being carried on appropriately and is not being impeded by the president or his staff any more than he's already mm -hmm. admitted to doing it. I got 20 seconds left. Final thought, David? No, I think that it's self-evident that Matt Whitaker... Uh, said today very clearly he didn't 
talk to the White House, didn't talk to the president, didn't impede this investigation. That definitely came out, even though the Democrats on the committee were rude to him and didn't even allow him to answer fundamental well, questions. It was a ridiculous sir. Congressman, Chairman Nadler said he's going to bring him back and possibly under subpoena to oh, get answers to those questions, so we'll see what happens. Gentlemen, thank you both very much. Good to have you here. Earlier tonight, during the State of the Union address, the president announced a second meeting with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. It'll be in Vietnam. Let's take a look. As part of a bold new diplomacy, we continue our historic push for peace on the Korean Peninsula. Our hostages have come home. Nuclear testing has stopped. And there has not been a missile launch in more than 15 months. If I had not been elected President of the United States, we would right now, in my opinion, be in a major war with North Korea. Much work remains to be done, but my relationship with Kim Jong-un is a good one. Chairman Kim and I will meet again on February 27th and 28th in Vietnam. Joining us now with more, South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham. Um, I was at the first summit in Singapore. Right. Fifteen months, no rockets fired. The remains of Americans from the 50s have returned. Hostages have been returned. The president has given nothing. And we are talking about the denuclearization of the entire Korean Peninsula. Right. Um, sounds pretty promising to me and well, hopeful. Well, to those people who are criticizing the president, how well did you do with Rocket Man? So, yeah, I'm very hopeful that one meeting, uh, this new meeting, will lead to a breakthrough. All right. Overall perception is why is he meeting with Trump and he didn't meet with anybody else? Interesting. Well, Maybe he believes that he's serious. I'll tell you why. I think he's scared. <laughs> Do you tell, well, well, go on. Well, okay, if you want to get this guy's attention, he's not like Iran. Iran's on a religious mission. You know, if they ever get nukes, they'll use them. This guy is trying to have an insurance policy to keep the mafia state going. But if Trump gives him an alternative between uh, life without nuclear weapons that is safe and secure, he'll take it if the other alternative is to lose your life. The thing that stood out the most, more than anything, that I'm so happy about... Why do you about, think the Taliban are at the table? It's a great point. I know. I think you're the table. Tell us why. Well, I've been going there. I've you been, ask your own questions. Yeah, so I, I like interviewing me. Uh, <laughs> I've been there 52 times. And why are they talking with us now? Because when the first day he got in office, he told the military to kick their ass. We've been killing these guys by the thousands. We've been breaking their back. And Pakistan, for the very first time in a decade, is beginning to help us on their side of the border because Trump has really unleashed the military. They're at the table. Uh, now because of the change in the rules of engagement after uh, Obama left, Trump came in, and they're at the table. And we may be able to win this, end this war, if Pakistan will help us. And I predict that the Prime Minister of Pakistan and President Trump will get along very well. Al-Qaeda, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, North Korea, China were making progress. Why has the, the, the caliphate been destroyed in about 18 months? You ask another great question. <laughs> because he unleashed the military. Yes, he did. See, Obama made it impossible to win. Trump has made it possible to win, and we're winning. I believe you, you're, you hit on something profound. We'll stay on national security. That is, if they believe you that you will do it, that is why the Europeans now cracking down on the Iranians because Trump gave them a choice. You can help me rein in this Iranian regime, or you will not have access to our economy. Guess what? They picked our economy over the Ayatollah. So add all of this foreign policy success. And I know you, you talk to the president a lot. They're safer. You disagree with him at times, but you, you make your case. You told me that he, he will, you have persuaded unlike, him on issues. Unlike Obama, he will adjust his policies where it makes sense. He has unleashed the military on our enemies. He's paying dividends. He has gotten out of a bad deal, and I think he would replace it with a better deal. We're more respected. We're safer today than we were two years ago, and it's because of this president. Let me go to the economy. So impressive. I, I, in 2016, for me, the election was about the forgotten men and women. I actually bought yeah. the original painting of this guy, John McNaughton. Right. Forgotten men and women <clears> in this country. <throat> the, the 13 million Americans on extra Americans on food stamps, 8 million more in poverty, worst recovery since the 40s, lowest homeownership rate 51 years, the debt, more debt than 43 presidents combined, lowest labor participation rate. 
5.3 million new jobs since he's elected. So how did all that happen, Sean? Well, I can tell you, because conservative economic policies, free market, capitalism, limited bureaucracy, less government intervention, incentivizing business to invest in factories, manufacturing centers. It worked for Reagan, it worked for Kennedy, and it's working for Trump. He, take every, he took and everything Bush. Obama did to suppress economic growth and replace it with pro-growth policies. He took all the fighting with the one hand tied behind your back approach to the war on terror and unleash the military. Everything Obama did, this guy's doing opposite, and it's working. Lindsey, what, I'm sorry, Senator, excuse me, <laughs> I've known you a long time. Remember uh, when Kavanaugh walked down? Oh, yeah. Listen, I think you had your a career moment that saved that nomination, and thank you for doing that. How many times have you heard a president say at the State of the Union what the Virginia governor said was un-American? Wow. So, okay. Mm -hmm. Kavanaugh walks down. you got more money in your pocket. Your country's stronger than ever. We're going to win. And when you say we're not a socialist country, they couldn't stand up. Even only Chuck and Nancy did because they didn't know what to do. The road to the nomination for the Democratic Party runs through Venezuela. <laughs> all right. You, you had to prepare that and think about that all day. I want to go to immigration. And I was asking Senator yeah. Cruz, yeah. your colleague, moments ago. Look, it looks like the president's going to have to go alone. Here's my fear, and you addressed it this week. Yeah. I'm they, they, there might be a number of your colleagues. I cannot support them. There's too many drugs, too much death. Too many assaults, too many angel moms and dads that I've met in my life. Will these Republicans step up and support securing our border for the safety, security, its life and death for the American people? Here's the question I would ask any Republican senator or member of the House. Do you disagree with what the president said about the state of the border? Do you disagree with the, the, the drug analysis? Do you disagree with the human trafficking problem? Do you disagree with the threats coming? Uh, through the border. If you agree with him, then have the courage to do something will about it. Will your Republican it. colleagues do what is right? They will if people like you remind them. Oh, I'm reminding you. I'm well, going to put pictures that up. that will help. So I love all of my colleagues, but this president, if he gets a dollar for the wall from Nancy, he's got to do it himself. Now, after this speech, do you have any doubt that he will do it if he has to alone? <laughs> I've known him for 20-some odd years. I know. So to my Republican yeah. friends, get on the train. I said 99.999% <laughs> that he... After what, tonight, it's, a, it's 102. Yeah. So if you're the president, how do you not secure the border after that speech? He's tenacious, he's unrelenting, and I know you've been a, become a good friend of his. Yes. Senator, good to be, thank you for stopping by. I know you're successful. We appreciate it. Thank That's you. That's right, thank God.